I, I, live, I live north of I-70, so, you know, we, we keep our shoes on most of the time. But, all right, thank you all for coming, especially uh, since you've already had to spend so much of the day with me. I'm not sure that uh, you felt like probably that you could learn anything else, but um, I'll just uh, maybe cover a little bit more to put um, some more meat on the bone, if you will. So um, when we talk about specifically reaching um, new people, I think we have to do that sometimes in very innovative ways. Because many times what we think is for new people, it really is about the things we like to do already. Yes? Do y'all hear me? Yeah, you know, chili and such. So... um, What I wanted to talk with you about this afternoon is a bridge event, okay? So a bridge event is for the sole purpose of building relationships with the unchurched, okay? So that means it can't be anything else. That's where we get ourselves into trouble is because we try to do things that serve multi-purposes. And when we do that, we dilute it all, all right? So first of all, You have to have a bridge event that is a P-free zone. The letter P, folks, for those of you that went in the wrong direction. Okay. It needs to be a P-free zone, which means no preaching, no prayers, no pressure, and no pocketbooks. So we cannot have a fundraiser and disguise it as a bridge event, okay? It needs to be out of the building and preferably off church grounds. Now, my guess is that some of you are already saying, oh, well, we do this event. We'll just make it into a bridge event. That can be done, but my experience is when we do that, that it just I cleaned this up a little bit. Upsets people in your church. Because we've changed the history of an event, and maybe we've even changed the purpose. So while you can do that, my experience is it's easier to do something brand new with the new criteria. Do you all hear me? All right. So that was just my first warning shot for you. All right, so when we're going to do a bridge event, what we instantly go for is planning the event itself. Stop it. We're getting ahead of ourselves when we do that. Okay? First of all, we need to plan a bridge event that meets the needs of the community or that is an activity that they would like to engage in. So many times we plan events for the purpose of reaching new people, but we plan them for things that we like to do in our little Christian dome. So we have to know our neighborhood and know who lives there in order to figure out the right event to have. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you a real bias here. And it, take it or leave it, it's just my bias. Sometimes we do events with other churches. And that's great. We're sharing resources. I get the why. But if a bridge event is for the sole purpose of building relationships so that they come to know Christ, how do you do that with other churches? Have you ever thought about that? We're just doing good things out there, and so somehow they'll end up in the churches, and they'll figure out which church to go to. My bias is that if you have a bridge event, it needs to be your church's bridge event. Because you're going to get names, and you're going to follow up. And so when the name box comes at the end of the session, and you decide, what are we going to do with the names? Well, do the Catholic get so much, and and the Baptists get so much, and the Presbyterian gets so much, and the Methodists. How do you do that? Now, it is about kingdom work, and I really don't care where people end up, but you are charged 
for the mission field from the United Methodist Church. You are a United Methodist disciple, so how are we doing that to grow our own church? Okay? So, the first thing, um, besides figuring out what's the right event, the second thing is to put a prayer team together. And we don't usually do that until the end as an afterthought, if at all. So the prayer team is praying for the event, praying for the community, praying for those that might participate in the event, praying that the church will be open to the new relationships. If you have a registration, perhaps they're praying over names. And that needs to be the number one thing you implement for a bridge event. Now, some um, of our churches, when they do a bridge event, they even have people that pray the area before the event. And that the event may be across town, but they're at the church in the sanctuary praying for that event and praying for the people. And as the names are beginning to be collected, the names are brought in and prayed over during the live event. Now, I just told you that there's no prayer, right? It's a pee-free zone. But that doesn't mean that it's not wrapped and undergirded in prayer from the church. You're not having people feel uncomfortable with putting prayer as one of the things you're leading with publicly with them. Now, we're Christians. We shouldn't be ashamed of preaching and prayers, right? Right? But people have baggage with church for a variety of reasons. And so bridge events are for the purpose of removing all barriers and baggage as much as possible so that we have the opportunity to build a relationship. What people need to understand and know about us church people is, could we hang with you? Could I see doing life with you? And if you're in their face with something that they're uncomfortable with because of baggage or just being unfamiliar, we lose that opportunity up front. So it's about removing barriers and first building relationship with one another before the relationship starts with Christ and the church. Y'all with me? Questions? What did you have for snack? Did you have carbs again? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So how do you build the event, even though it's being, it's done by the church, the community is going, going to know that it's the church. How do you get over that? Hurdle? Well, most of the time it's through advertising that we shoot ourselves in the foot. Because it's <clears throat> X united Methodist Church presents, <laughs> as opposed to community trunk or treat. And all the things that are beneficial for someone to attend, why I would want to attend, and at the bottom it's sponsored by X United Methodist Church. So it isn't about us, but yet that's what we always lead with. It truly is a community event. So it's how we advertise it. And it's not like we're ashamed of who we are, but that's not what they're going to come to do is worship. They're not coming to be preached at. They're... So you need to lead it with what the event is all about, and at the bottom, then it's sponsored by. Okay? All right, so prayer team is number one, and then the next thing we need to determine um, after we determine the, the, the type of event is we need to be thinking through um, what, how are we going to get names, Okay, it's relationship building. So without names, how are we going to build a relationship? Remember, we talked about blind dates and you don't ask for their number. That's kind of what we're talking about. Drawings or giveaways, Drawings or giveaways that's correct. Um, so think about what is the giveaway that is so valuable for someone that they're willing to give you their contact information. People's personal information is valuable. They're not going to give it away just because they came to an event. 
Think about the giveaway as it relates to who it is that you are targeting for this particular event. So go back to what we talked about envisioning earlier today. You've got to know your mission field, and, and you've got to figure out who you're called to serve, who is your responsibility. Know your demographics. And then go specifically, there's mosaic types. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's the different profiles within your community. Go in deeply into those because if you do, they will tell you in those profiles what they like to do in their spare time, what they read, what websites they visit. I mean, we make this really hard, but the things are right at our fingertips. So go in and do your research and do the event, first of all, based on who you're trying to reach, who's your target, and then make sure that the giveaway also is valuable to those people that you are hoping to reach. Y'all follow me? Because don't have a children's event, you know, and give away um, a, a, a pass to the Senior Citizen Center, right? If it's, if it's about families, then, you know, what are some tickets to a family event? If it's for children, are we giving away a bike? You know, think through who is our targeted market and what is the gift or gift. Sometimes it's multiple depending on how big. Now, here's the other thing is we think the more people, the better. That's usually where we head to. If, if, we, if we're shooting for 100, um, then 300 would be even better. Again, I just caution you that that could get us into some trouble. Go back to its purpose. The purpose is to build relationships. Relationships take time. They take energy. They take resources. So we have to allow for the number of people that are willing to build relationships after the event and then target how many are you want to attend based on how many you can build relationships with. Do y'all follow me? So if you are a church of 50 and you have an event of 500, there are probably 400 of those that you're not going to be able to follow up with because you just don't have the capacity to do so. So do a smaller, more manageable event for the size of your church. Because bigger is not always better. Right? I think that's one of the things we do as churches many times. We try to be all things to all people <laughs> instead of doing a few things and do them really, really well. And the same is true with bridge events. What is a size of crowd that is manageable for us to build relationships with and target that amount? Okay? All right, so we've got the prayer team. We've determined the type of event. We've determined the, the, the giveaway, how we're going to collect names, right? And then we begin planning the event. Do you see all the things that need to come first? Now, Everyone who you recruit, yes, sir. Okay, tell me more about the, the difference between uh, a registration. You, is the registration the same thing as getting their name for a giveaway? Usually registration is you're just wanting their name for nothing in return. Okay. Um, a drawing is, I am giving you my valuable information for the chance of winning the iPad. Okay, but if you are concerned about having too many people, okay, then you may want some registration. The other thing I was thinking about, if it's a feed them event, mm -hmm. you would need to know about how many to prepare for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> your firstborn thumbprint. What we find is people are skeptical of churches anyway. And when we ask for that kind of registration, they are reluctant and they're more likely not to come if we ask for that. I would much rather um, probably have food left over 
um, and, and shoot big instead of doing registration if it's only for the purpose of a food. When they put their name in the drawing for something to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something in return for them giving their contact information. Yes. Any other questions? Go ahead. You know, we, um, I'm, I'm working with a church planter, um, and it's a um, blue-collar, working, small neighborhood, okay? And um, I think sometimes you have to think about how do we reach people based on how they like to receive information, because in some places, it's all about social media. But in that particular place, they put flyers on doors. So it costs them $8 from the local copies or go to the library or whatever. And they actually went door to door and gave people flyers and, and invited them. And it worked there. Now, in other places, that won't work. So I think we have to know our context and how are people most open to receiving the information. And where are they find? how do they get information now and how can we piggyback on where they're getting their information? Is there like um, a newsletter that goes out with one of the utility bills? Is there, you know, sometimes it's things going out through schools, um, a community newsletter of some sort. Yeah, back in here, yeah. We have never had a problem, never had a problem. And if you are concerned about that, then just put something on the form that says, and you give us permission you know, to reach out to you if you're concerned about that. But I haven't had a church that um, has put that disclaimer, but, it, but haven't had a, a problem with it either. The other thing you have to make sure is that the event is not something that all you're gonna get is the other church people in town that you're just gonna get the Baptists and the Christians and the Presbyterians, right? Because so many times we do the events and they're churchy events, so all we do is attract other churches. So think through that too. There's another question, yes. Or, or you can come in, but you can't have the breaks and you can't have lunch, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. So part of it was the advertising. Could we have scaled back on advertising for, for fewer people to have arrived? Or um, sometimes you do block parties, so you do this part of town here, and then you know in three months you do the other part of town. So part of it is how did you get the word out, and did the word go too wide um, for, for how you advertised? And then sometimes when you, um, when you do the drawings, some churches have said, um, do you have a church home 
This is the most important part. Where you regularly attend worship. Because if you just say, do you have a church home? Many people have church homes. They haven't been there for 10 years, but they still feel that they have a church home. But if you just say, do you have a church home where you regularly attend? My guess is the 250 would have become that would have become a whole lot less, and then you would have known who those then that were best to build the relationship with. Correct. Correct. They still get their name in the drawing, and all that's great, but it just allows you to target a little bit more. Now, now some, some folks are uncomfortable with that. So, again, it's your own context and how you uh, are most comfortable with it, but there are churches that kind of um, do that filter um, for the whole follow-up, too. All right. So remember we talked about radical hospitality? When you have the event, you've got to think about hospitality there, just like you do, if not even more so, on Sunday morning. This is first impression. People are trying to figure out if they could do life with you, if they could hang out with you. How are we being hospitable? So people have to be assigned to hospitality. We can't give everybody the job of running the bouncy house or popping the popcorn or serving the hot dogs or picking up trash or whatever. Because that's what we do is we give everybody a job. Who is assigned welcome and hospitality and information and that kind of thing? Make sure you think of that through and think strategically about who those people should be. You know, I have a friend... Her name is Patty. And I don't care where we're at. Between two floors and an elevator, she can have someone's whole life history and they were happy to tell you. You know, you all have those people that just can talk with people and, and just connect with almost anyone. Those are your hospitality people. Please don't have them serving hot dogs. Right? And the grumpy people, have them serving the hot dogs. Serve in our giftedness. Okay? So really think through that. Pastor, do not take a job. Your chief evangelist, how are you out there being the face of the church? We had one um, pastor who they just had an extra set. It was a, this back-to-school bash I was telling you about earlier. They had an extra set of uh, Walmart gift cards, $10 a piece. And he would just be visiting with a family, and as the Lord led, he'd just pull out a $10 gift card and say, you know, if there are any gaps in what you needed for school supplies or school um, clothing, here's a gift for you. Be out amongst the people, talking with them, right? You could have one gift, or you could give several gifts away from the drawing, but you could also do auxiliary things, um, just special gifts like that, too. Okay? So we've had a great event. We had great hospitality. We connected with people, and then what? And the then what is normally, we put all the names in an Excel spreadsheet, do we not? <laughs> and then what? Oh, we add them to the newsletter. Okay. Do assimilate the names. But please don't start with the, guests, with the newsletter. Okay. And please, oh please, oh please, do not send a form letter from the office or from the pastor. How touchy-feely is that? Okay. One-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly. This is where the rubber hits the road, folks. So when you are planning the event, you need to be thinking about what the follow-up looks like. Do not have the event if you don't have a group of people who are committed to doing the follow-up. You hear me? Do not do the event unless you have a committed group of people all ready to do the follow-up. Again, it's like you went out on a blind date and you did give their number and then they didn't call. So it's important to have all of these teams in place 
before you ever do the event. Because here's the problem, is we collect all those names in three to six months, we still haven't done anything with them. Or we wait a month to do something. We don't wanna do that. In 24 to 48 hours, the first follow-up needs to occur. And I want your team to have some sort of an idea of what that follow-up looks like. Okay? For instance, the first step may be a note card, a postcard from a connector. Okay, so the connector is one of those people that have said, I will do the follow up. And then it is K Kotan following up. It is not X United Methodist Church. Do you see the difference? It's not an organization. But it's an individual caring for building a relationship with someone else. Okay? So if you are planning the event, order the postcards. Put the stamp on it for them. Don't make it some churchy postcard. Make it a secular kind of postcard. Okay? And it needs to be handwritten. The lost art of handwriting. And if not, if they just leave an email address, you can still do a personal message via email. Okay? Thank you for attending um, the community event XYZ. It was great to have you as a guest. We so appreciated your attendance. If there's anything that I or the church could do to be helpful, please don't hesitate to call. Okay, Cotan, my home cell number. Nope. I just said, or the church. If I or the church could be helpful. And then I put my own name and my own phone number. So you are including the church. If the church, I or the church could be helpful. Mm -hmm. There. Absolutely. But it's not on the church letterhead. And it's not coming from the pastor. But you said, or the church. But are you identifying this church? Um, not at that point. But, but they've just been to the event sponsored by, so they probably know that. But that's not what I'm leading with is the church. Yeah. But I, but I don't want to completely leave it out at the same time, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Okay? And, yes? So, you were talking about accepting a secular card. Mm-hmm. So, do you use, like, do you use the theme on the flyer for the event? Could you do that same Absolutely. Absolutely. She was talking about using kind of the same logo event marketing that you used um, from the event itself when you were doing that, that advertising. Absolutely. Then there was a recognition of that. Okay. Um, so then you want to say, okay, so now in two weeks, what's the next step? What's the next step? And so maybe it's another note card, right? Now, do you remember we talked about you've got to think about your church calendar as a whole? You need to be thinking about what secular topics are going to be preached on in the month coming up after a bridge event. Okay, think about that. If there is opportunity of relationship building, you may have some walk-ins. Are we preaching on something that is secular in nature, that is a felt need of the people who are hurting in the community? Right? So that is not the time to do the Book of John. It could be a time to do the Book of John, but we do it in a way that is getting after those needs and desires in the community. Think about it from the way we... Um, the way we put it um, in, in, in topic and what we're going to cover. Um, usually relationships, people are struggling with all sorts of relationships, so usually that's a really good topic to hit right after a bridge event. And it could be parenting, it could be generic relationships, it could be parents, you know, parenting your parents kind of things. Okay. Well, we hope it's in your community. It's on Facebook, but... Right, it's on Facebook. And so if there's, so the ones that are gonna walk in right away, there is some sort of 
spirit moving in them already, a curiosity, right? So they're going to be more open and probably seeking that would be on your website, perhaps. Most people shop you on your website before they ever give you the opportunity to worship. So on your website and also on the um, on your sign out front. And you could also do that on Facebook. Um, but you could have some postcards laying around uh, or, or flyers or something about that upcoming topic. I wouldn't put it in everybody's bag. I wouldn't make sure. But you could be having it lay around too, possibly. Okay? And if you're going to do, let's say you're going to do um, a series on parenting, then you, we also have to think, okay, then what comes next? And maybe that's parenting classes, or you bring in some sort of specialist to speak about parenting, right? So you're going to continue on those themes because we always have to think of handoffs. What's next? What's next? What's next for our folks? What opportunities? Because most of the time we do things in little silos, but we don't connect them to other pieces that would allow them to take the next step. Y'all with me? Okay, so then after two or three handwritten cards, the same person, okay? I'm taking responsibility for 10 people or 12 people or 20 people. And I'm walking through the whole way with them. So it's not like they get one from Joe and Sue and Ellen and, and anybody else. It's I am taking personal responsibility myself for those 10 people. <clears throat> so then maybe the third time or the fourth time is you pick, up the call, you pick up the phone. And at that point, it's, hey, it's Kay um, from X United Methodist Church. We're now, interest, we're now introducing that. And to say, you know, I've reached out a few times after the um, event, um, XYZ event, and I just wanted to call and check in, and is there anything that I or the church could do to be helpful? You know, I hope you have a, a, a great upcoming summer vacation, um, and if there's anything we could do, be sure to let us know. A touch point, it's quick. Okay? And then what is the next time? So what you're going to need is the scripts for a framework, okay? Because it needs to be personal. It needs to be authentic. But what are those note card messages what are possible handoffs, secular in nature? It's a huge step into worship for most people. But what's the next small step that they could potentially take? And be ready with those handoffs. And if the handoffs are outside the church, more the better. Okay? They're probably not quite ready. So have the scripts for the note cards. Have the scripts for the conversation for those folks. Now... Be prepared. When you say, is there anything that I or the church could do to be helpful, be prepared. Okay? Now, what some churches have found when they do that is that they begin to be asked about social services. Right? I'm having trouble with my utilities. I'm, okay? Now, I'm not asking you to start paying people's um, utility bills. If, if that's discretionary funds, then you handle it the way you would anyway. But provide your connectors a list of social services that they can refer to. Or other churches have said, I would love to um, have Pastor Paula reach out to you and give you some um, helpful tips or information on meeting that need. And then it becomes a pastoral care-centered situation. Now, I'm still going to continue my relationship building, but then we also have another piece brought in for pastoral care. Okay? Questions about that? Yeah. I'd just like to know if you have any tried and proven examples, and have there been any conversions? Have, has there been measurable success? So let me share you the, uh, uh, have you um, hear the story of Charlie. 
So um, Charlie is about 80 years old, and, and Charlie was convinced that the only way to get people to church was to invite people to church. Okay? And so when we began to work on a consultation um, with his church, um, he's very um, faithful and very loyal. And he said, you know, I'm not sure that I really believe in this, but I really want to support my pastor and what he's asking me to do, so I'll try it. So they had an event, and he took 12 people. And he began with the note cards, and then he began with the phone calls. And to begin with, folks, it's scripted to some degree or at least some framework. But then it's the intuition that takes over at some point. And Charlie said, on one of the phone calls, I just knew it was time for the next step. And he said to the young woman on the other end of the line, he said, before I let you go today, I just wondered, is there anything that um, I can be in prayer for you about? And there's silence at the other end of the line. And finally, with trembling voice, she said, yes. She said, my mother was just diagnosed with cancer last week. And he said, oh, I would love to pray for you and your mother. Ask her name. And he said, would you like to pray now? And he said, I don't know why I said that. I said, yeah, you do. And she said, you do that? And he said, well, absolutely. And so they prayed over the phone. So Charlie began to call her every week to check in on how she was doing and how her mother was doing and walking alongside her. Four months after the event, folks, four months, the young woman walked into church one day and said, where's Charlie? I want to meet Charlie. Who was more transformed in that moment? It was Charlie. And see, there was no accident that Charlie ended up with that woman's name because Charlie had lost a wife the year before with the exact same type of cancer. So not only was Charlie able to identify and walk with this woman, but it was healing for Charlie to be able to do that with this other woman. So those are the kind of narratives that you can find over and over and over again. What I would say is many churches give up after two note cards. And so you don't see the fruit from their labors because they didn't finish. They might have planted the seed, and maybe they watered it once, but we never fertilized it, nor did we ever water it again. Now, is everyone going to convert? Absolutely not. And you may end up to the point, and, and you're going to know, like I said, this is the art, this is the, in, the intuitive piece of this. You're going to know when it's, when it's time to say, you know, I'm just curious. Do you have a church home where you regularly attend? Because if not, I would love for you to be my guest. But maybe it's an event that makes sense before worship. So that's why you've got to have some of these handoffs that are small next steps that you can possibly invite to. And then, you know, could I pick you up or I'll be sure to be, I'll meet you at the front door. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the one with the spiky hair meeting you at the door, look for me because I'm gonna be watching for you. It's intentional and it's building over time. And most of the time we as churches get too impatient and we're just on to doing the next thing rather than investing in the relationships. But the churches that do do it and do see it through are building relationships. And just like in worship, folks, 
When somebody comes for the first time on Sunday, what's next? If they come for a second Sunday, what's next? If they come a first time and don't come a second time, what's next? What is your connection process? And so every time we think through church, we've got to figure that piece out. Because again, we're in the relationship building and we have to intentionally build relationships. Y'all know relationships are hard work. They really are. But somehow we're back in still our attraction mode of thinking that people are just going to show up because that's what they used to do and they don't anymore. We have to be more intentional and outwardly focused and going out to people. Be with, be where they are, not expect them to come and be who we are and where we are. Questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and that would be most of them, right? Okay, so her, what bridge event is for young people? Are we talking 20s? Are we talking teenagers? Okay, so, so um, college age and, and those, they're just trying to figure out life. You know, they're trying to figure out who they are and, and what, their, what their calling is. They're not going to call it calling, but, you know, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? So we find that those age groups really appreciate small social settings that have little structure. Okay? So that could be um, come out and you just have um, maybe a topic. It's only a topic and you throw it out there and people are just talking about how that affects them in a social setting right? I always say there's three levels of evangelism, and this is kind of links into your question. One of it is the one-on-one -on -one stuff we do that is our third session this afternoon. It's our individual ways of interacting with our community where we're building relationships with people one-on-one. -on -one. And the second one is what I call elbow events, an elbow, and I, I, I really say they really should be called elbow activities instead of events because event sounds really big and hard, right, and time-consuming. But what do you already like to do that you could invite an unchurched person to do with you? So maybe you love to play bridge. Maybe you love to fish. Maybe you love to play golf. Maybe you love to knit or crochet. So how could you and a couple of church people invite a couple of unchurched people and hang out and do the things you love to do already. It's, it's easy. You know, you could go to the world champion uh, Royals ball game. Go Royals. Do we not have any Royals fans here? <laughs> but what are the things that you love to do? But be more intentional about inviting unchurched people. Do y'all know your neighbors? Do you know anything beyond their names? Do you know something about them? Or do you know their story? A lot of times we just need to start at home. Have you thought about having a barbecue, either in the driveway or the backyard, and inviting your neighbors? Do your neighbors know one another? How could you invite a church couple um, to host with you and they bring some of their neighbors? So those are the elbow kind of things where you bring people in on your elbow in small social settings that you already like to do. And then the third level of evangelism are these bridge events, where the big church-wide events that you do for the sole purpose of building relationships with the unchurched. So part of the, the younger generation is around more elbow kind of activities than the big events is what we're finding. Other questions? Um, a young family, depending on how young, um, sometimes they like things like around bike safety 
or you know a bike rodeo um, and, and sometimes it's like a, um, a family carnival kind of thing where can we come out as a family and just have a good time no pressure it's not gonna cost us anything you know because dinner and a movie for your family you know is not cheap right but where could I come and hang out with my family just have a good time and not worry about anything Okay, so on the, um, on the back of your form here today, I wanted you to have, this is how you do a bridge event. There is a whole list of ideas for different bridge events. Okay, you, there, are, there are countless others. So don't feel like you need to choose off of this list. But choose something that makes sense for your context Choose something that makes sense for the targeted niche in your mission field that you're trying to reach. Right? And you, you know, folks, I, I just have to say that all of us want young families, all of us want children, all of us want youth in our churches. Right? But there are a lot of senior citizens that don't know Christ either. And have we ever thought about doing bridge events? for senior citizens, retirees. You know, what about those that are transitioning out of work um, into retirement? You know, what, what if we did some sort of event to help people plan for retirement? Or those that are facing having to move out of their home of 40 years? So yeah, we want young people, and it's great, but there are other demographics that we need to be reaching as well. Yeah. How do we build an event to attract more diversity? I mean, it's predominantly white church, mm -hmm. but I'd like to see more of you. Absolutely. So um, I'm probably going to answer this a little different than you might expect. Okay. I would love to know the demographics of each of your church. First of all, we have to start there. Okay, so what are the demographics in the neighborhood of your church? Now, in some of our churches, we're 99% white in a 60% um, black neighborhood. We do not reflect our community. So sometimes what we want is not what's in our community. Now, that is not to say that all people aren't welcome. Open hearts, open doors, open minds. Yes. But when we are a truly diverse congregation, we reflect the community, whatever's in the community. So if we are an 80% Caucasian um, neighborhood, then we should see an 80% Caucasian congregation with 10% black and 10% Hispanic or whatever it is. Because I think sometimes we want diversity so bad that we're trying to get diversity where diversity isn't in the neighborhood already. Does that make sense? Okay, now, what happens so many times is we have, the, the, the congregation, the neighborhood has changed, okay? So the church was planted there 60 years ago, and it was an all-white neighborhood, okay? Or 100 years ago, <laughs> yeah, all right? And then those folks um, that still go there, most of them don't live there anymore. They now drive back in to the neighborhood. So when you say you've got to take responsibility for your neighborhood, they have no clue who their neighborhood is because they don't live in that neighborhood, nor do they feel many times a sense of responsibility for that neighborhood because that's not where they live, that's not where they shop, that's not where they do life. They just come there for an hour on Sunday, right? So that's one of the hard conversations we have to have as a church is... Are, do we really mean that we want to reach this neighborhood? Do we really mean that we're okay with whoever from our neighborhood walks in, that you'll worship next to them? 
maybe even give him your seat. I think those are the hard conversations we have to have first before we just say we want to be a diverse congregation. Who, who lives here? And are we really ready to prepare to receive, to hear them, and also do worship, do uh, discipleship in a way that's meaningful for the people we're trying to reach? Because if we're not willing to do all of those things, all we're going to do is build more resistance to the church because someone came in and gave it a try and then they had a horrible experience. So sometimes we have to go outside the church. If our church, if our congregation isn't willing to take responsibility and really serve our neighbors and be willing to worship with our neighbors, then sometimes I was telling somebody on a break that we had a church who literally was on one side of the tracks. And really, the, the, there was another demographic that was on the other side of the tracks. And we had the professionals, the white collars, the teachers, the principal, all of that in our church. And then the other side of the track, we'll go across the track and serve them. But I'm not sure I want to worship with them. I'm really not sure I want them next to me in the pew. Now, some would think it, but this church would even say it. So the smart pastor there knew that we had to go about this in a different way. So rather than asking that demographic to cross the track to come to us, there is an additional worship center in the community center in their neighborhood that we're taking worship to them and building a relationship there. Will the two ever come together? I don't know, but that's not the most important thing to me. More people are coming to know Christ because we crossed the tracks and were willing to be what they needed to be. They didn't want church music, or they didn't want organ music with a the choir. They were looking for country, country music or bluegrass music. So how do we go and find the musicians that can play music in a way that will touch their hearts and for them to hear God? So sometimes we have to do it in a very different way to reach the new people. But sometimes we're forcing diversity where diversity is not in the neighborhood, too. So I guess the the short answer is it depends. (laughs) And I think our United Methodist Church is struggling with that to some degree. They really are. And we're just having to try a lot of unique things because Every context is so different to say that here's the rubber stamp, I gift it to you, you use it, and it will work magic. And we know that's not the case. The needs of the community are different. The passions of the leaders are different. The gifts of the congregation are different. And so because of all of that, the sauce we mix it in is all different. Other questions? How are we doing on time? Five after three, so we're about to wrap up, right? Yes, ma'am. Another question on the movie night. This is a mm-hmm. classic, and I know I'm just from a little bitty podunk town in the middle of nowhere, but I'm worried about a movie lighting thing for me to be able to show a movie. Is that a concern that churches have? No, especially when you do not um, charge admission. You're not making any money off of it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, we did, um, one church was doing a movie night, and they went to a large, now this wouldn't be in your context, but there was a, um, an apartment complex, and they rented one of those blow-up um, outside movie screens, and they did it specifically targeted for those apartment dwellers, and provided popcorn and, you know, some face painting and that kind of thing for the kids, and so it was a very... It was one of those where it was a small church, and they could only do so much, so they chose an apartment complex and went in and did it. Now, obviously, you have to approve that with the management. (laughs) Don't just show up there with your movie screen one night. But it works great. And so then they could go on to a different apartment complex and so on. So get just kind of get creative. Ma'am.
Right. So, so one of the, I think the tools that is most helpful is you do those community surveys. You talk with, you know, what are the greatest needs of, um, of our community with um, those community leaders, mayor, um, police, all, uh, all of those. Um, and then um, there is what I call the mosaic type. So if you go into Mission Insight and you look specifically at your mission field, there are demographic profiles of who lives in your mission field. And there is a four page on each different mosaic type. There is a four page in-depth um, description of those folks. Average age, um, working, um, what kind of cars they drive, what kind of houses they live in, um, what they like to do um, in their leisure time, what websites they look at, what, um, what magazines they read, and what, so all of those things I think help you figure out what those bridge events look like. Um, if you, Mission Insight, you all use that in the conference is my understanding, um, and it's, it's a conglomeration of a lot of different information, census and that kind of thing. So um, you would need a password from whoever your administrator is, is there anybody here from the conference? Um, whoever the administrator is to get into Mission Insight, and then once you have that password to get into Mission Insight, it's your apportionment dollars at work, um, then you can get, get in and look at your mission field and then get the executive summary, and in the executive summary, it will tell you what mosaic types live in your mission field. The district administrators. The district, thank you. The district administrators can get you into Mission Insight. Other questions? Okay, so let me tell you a story about um, a, a successful bridge event, and then you all can take a little break before we get started again. So we had a church um, in an outlying suburban area, um, one of the fastest growing counties. And the church had um, plateaued for the last 20 years as the community had tripled in size. Okay? So we had a new pastor, and the new pastor said, okay, we got to do something new here. We have all of these... Um, new people that have moved in, but how did all these people move in and even we didn't get any of them? So they began to plan a bridge event, and their bridge event was um, a family day. Now, they happened to have a field next to the church, and you wouldn't even know it was the church's field, right? So they had vacation Bible school, um, but they um, had never really done anything with it. I mean, they did the children's program on Sunday, you know, to try to get them to come back on Sunday, but that wasn't working so well for them. So they decided, you know, if they wanted to do a children's festival after Vacation Bible School, then let's really make it a festival. So they roughly had 150 children or so in Vacation Bible School, and all week they were sending home, you know, teasers about this whole big family festival um, that was coming up. So they put a big tent out in this field, and um, they did signage, and they um, advertised in the newspaper, and then, this is one of the most brilliant things they did, they contacted the local police department and fire department and said, hey, would you like to be a part of this community event? And so the police came and, you know, brought one of their cruisers that kids could crawl in and, you know, play with the buttons and stuff. And the, they brought a fire truck out that the kids could climb on and get their picture taken in and, you know, sit behind the wheel. And they had 650 people show up. And that was on Saturday. So they had vacation Bible school from Monday to Friday with about 150 kids that had 600 and some show up on Saturday for the festival. And then, and they had a musician and, and a band playing during it too, so there were times that you could sit down and rest with your family if you wanted. So there were several different things going on simultaneously. And then they said, and we're gonna have this band back tomorrow during our worship service, and you are welcome to join us. And they worshiped outside. See, again, 
they had a handoff there. And they had the band that they already liked hearing, and they knew they would be back. So, with all due respect, they had what they called a geriatric service. Um, their first service, they called it their geriatric service because there were just walkers lined up against the walls at their first service. And so the pastor knew that this was risky because people with walkers were not going to be able to walk out into the field and set in July under a tent. So at that point, they were averaging about um, 320 or so in worship in three services. And so he knew he was going to lose most people because they did one combined service. But here's what's happened, the neat thing, is yes, we lost some people because of disability issues. But we had 62 first-time guests the next day for worship. 62. Now, that's 10%. Now, if any of you are in marketing communications, that's phenomenal to have a 10% return the next day. But there was a hunger, and they did it well. They did it with excellence. I think that's the other thing is don't do it if you can't do it well. And do it on a scale that you can do it well. Right? And so that, that church is growing exponentially and so much of it is because they finally got outside the doors and they did something specifically targeted to who they were trying to reach. They have children in a daycare Monday through Friday and not one family was associated in the life of the congregation because there was no intentionality, no, str no strategy to make that happen. It, it happens now, right? So it does work. It's hard work though and it takes time. It certainly takes time. Okay, in your guidebooks, folks, on page um, 12, okay, there's no reason for you to come and sit and learn if we're not going to do anything about it. We're all about action. So with your church group, um, you all can cuddle, huddle up in different places in here. First of all, each of you individually fill out What's the big idea? What's your big takeaway from your uh, core session today? And then I want you to share those with one another. Then based on your sharing with one another, what's the one step that you all will take as a church to implement something from today? And then talk about the next step and who's responsible. So this is a kind of a flow sheet to help you think through ideas and create action steps and hold you accountable for doing so. Because I just don't want you to come here and marinate in information and then the book goes on your desk when you get back and then it gets to a bookshelf and then you end up dusting it in a year. And for the time that you invested here, it makes no difference in the life of your congregation. That is not what we're about. So we're, this is to help you with the rubber hitting the road, if you will. So gather in your churches, work through your um, action plan, and um, you have a little bit of break, and we're going to see you back here for your final plenary. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>